we were very interested in understanding the cardiovascular implications of COVID. We basically soon after the pandemic hit um, and started spreading across the eastern part of the U.S., we realized that um, we really needed to try to get a sense of um, the pandemic, its implications at, in U.S. hospitals, uh, and also uh, as the reports were emerging regarding potential cardiovascular complications and thrombotic complications that we needed to move beyond all the limitations of single center uh, experiences and much of the anecdote that was uh, guiding the evidence in the early part of the pandemic. We've registered um, over 15,000 so far from uh, well over 100 US hospitals um, and uh, that continues to grow. So um, we will be presenting at the American Heart Association meeting the results from some of the first and second cuts of the data, which uh, represent in the first cut about uh, 9,000 people and in the second cut uh, closer to 15,000 people. Um, we're tracking about 200 different variables, uh, including um, extensive uh, demographic information, including past uh, medical history with cardiovascular risk factors and previous cardiac history, which, as you know, uh, seem to be very important risk factors for severe COVID infection. Uh, we're tracking previous medications and medications used in the hospital to treat COVID and its complications, including immunosuppressive agents, steroids, remdesivir, um, and even experimental uh, therapies. And then we're collecting a host of adverse outcomes, obviously death and ventilation, um, ICU stay, but then we're tracking all of the individual cardiac outcomes that have been reported, including the thrombotic outcomes, myocardial infarction, stroke, venous thromboembolism, but also new heart failure, myocarditis, um, and, uh, and other cardiac complications. Uh, trying to get a sense of whether some of the, you know, anecdotal reports of cardiac complications are as common as uh, have been reported. And, and, and even if we can correlate um, uh, patient factors with some of the cardiac complications. One of, one of the real unique features of the registry is we're, we're collecting a large amount of laboratory and biomarker data. So we're collecting serial laboratory data for the full course of the admission. And we have over 100,000 uh, laboratory data points so far in the registry. I think it can. I mean, one of the things that we've done, I mean, obviously there was a, a passion and commitment from volunteers to get this thing up and running fast because, you know, we're, we're all worldwide in the same boat with, uh, with so much um, uncertainty about the pandemic and the virus. And, and so everybody was committed, but at, at this, and we also realized that the usual way of doing things where you, with the registry where an investigator submits an idea and it might take 18 months before the idea emerges as publishable knowledge that that wouldn't work. So in addition to setting up the registry, um, getting the data in quickly, we also did something different with regard to data analysis uh, and, and uh, what we call democratizing the process and creating what we're describing as sort of a birth science approach. What we've done is capitalized on the American Heart Association's precision medicine platform. And we take proposals from initially investigators participating as site investigators, but uh, soon uh, investigators worldwide who want to use the data. And then if the uh, approval is scientifically meritorious and doesn't overlap, we allow the investigative teams to analyze the data themselves on a secure cloud-based platform, which is the AHA's precision medicine platform. So what ends up happening is instead of one analytical center um, doing analyses in, um, in series, we have dozens of teams of investigators using the same database in, in parallel so that we can get much more uh, science done in a much shorter period of time. And I do think to your point that that is something that's uh, totally applicable for the future for registries uh, and, and also much lower cost. Um, it's, it's a lower cost um, democratized strategy for capitalizing on the information in the registries, but you still have to build in the quality control and make sure that the, uh, that the scientific output is of the highest quality. The first abstract is, will uh, prevent the, present the overview of the registry and this new sort of approach to birth science so that we can get uh, discovery and translation of knowledge quickly. Um, and we'll also in, in that um, 
uh, analysis report some overall findings from the registry, which uh, unfortunately show very high mortality rates. The aggregate mortality rate in the first uh, 14 or so thousand individuals is over 16% um, in the hospitals uh, with very high rates of uh, ventilator, ventilator and ICU uh, uh, stays. What we also see though, is that the rates of cardiovascular events are lower um, than uh, what we had thought they would be. So th this remains predominantly a, a respiratory disease with the dominant cause of death being respiratory and only about 10% um, uh, of the deaths being related to cardiac complications. And the individual cardiac event rates like heart attacks, strokes, heart failure are actually quite uncommon, uh, as are myocarditis. Now, that doesn't mean they're not important events when you think about how many patients are hospitalized with COVID. It's just that they occur in uh, a, a, a minority of individuals, each of them uh, well below 5% um, in terms of uh, cardiac event rates. In things like myocarditis, um, we're seeing in only uh, about 0.3% uh, of individuals. In addition, DVT and PE, which are uh, obviously important complications of uh, of hospitalized COVID, uh, we're seeing rates that are also below 5%, considerably lower than in studies in which that they are uh, purposely uh, surveyed for. So suggesting that clinically diagnosed DVT and PE may be a bit less common uh, than we thought it might be. But that, that, that doesn't mean it's not still a potentially devastating complication of the virus. So the second abstract we'll present uh, investigates race and ethnic differences in COVID in, in U.S. hospitals. And um, this is a, a disappointing and, and somewhat depressing message, frankly. We see that the proportion of Black and Hispanic individuals in the registry is much higher um, than their proportion in the U.S. population and even their proportion uh, in the census tracts from the hospitals that admitted these patients. So Black and Hispanic patients uh, have been much more likely to be hospitalized with uh, severe COVID. Once hospitalized, though, what we see is that the rates of death and major complications are similar after accounting for patient differences. So that it looks like the treatment and outcomes of the hospitalized patients is similar, suggesting that the lesion in leading to higher rates of severe COVID in Black and Hispanic individuals really exists upstream of the hospital uh, in the pre-hospital setting and obviously relates to social factors, uh, structural racism and, and other factors in US communities that have led to higher rates of COVID infection and later presentation and, and more severe presentations with COVID for black and Hispanic individuals. The black and Hispanic individuals that were hospitalized are substantially younger and more obese than uh, 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 non-Hispanic white individuals that were hospitalized. And then the, the third abstract that will be presented by Nick Hendren uh, focuses on obesity and age. And um, the message here is that the, the individuals hospitalized with COVID are markedly more obese than the US population as reflected in a national survey called NHANES. And this is particularly magnified in young people. So among the young people hospitalized with COVID, um, uh, severe obesity is dramatically overrepresented, suggesting that that's really the lesion in young people that get very sick with COVID is severe obesity. Once hospitalized, the patients with uh, severe obesity, as expected, as we've already said, are, are younger and more likely to be Black and Hispanic. But we see a, a significant risk signal associated with obesity that's really dose dependent. Um, so people, uh, as body mass index goes up, the probability of death and of uh, need for mechanical ventilation goes up substantially in, in a linear fashion. But importantly, we saw an interaction with age so that the hazards of obesity are magnified in young people um, so that people under 50 with obesity have a much higher relative hazard, for example, for a BMI above 40 than do older individuals. And we think this is a really important public health message, at least in the US and I'm guessing in other parts of the world, um, young people have been getting the message that they're relatively protected from the virus. And the message from these analyses is that that doesn't apply to young people who are obese, and particularly if they have severe obesity, um, where uh, they're more likely to be hospitalized, and when hospitalized, uh, much more likely to end up on a ventilator or to die um, than uh, non-obese younger individuals. So we think that's a really important public health message that needs to get out to young people um, who uh, have non-ideal uh, body mass indexes.
Yeah, I think I'd say three take home messages. Number one is that, um, you know, the it's possible uh, to get a uh, large uh, registry off the ground very quickly uh, when all the priorities align. Um, two, that, that there are new strategies for um, capitalizing on um, technologies to uh, rapidly enhance knowledge transfer, uh, which is necessary in a pandemic, but also will be valuable, as you mentioned, outside of the pandemic. Um, three, I'd say that the pandemic uh, in the U.S. has disproportionately affected um, Black and Hispanic individuals. Uh, and that the, uh, that, that issue uh, appears to be due to factors that happen before they get to the hospital. And then finally, um, obesity and particularly severe obesity is a major risk factor for severe COVID um, and for uh, death and ventilation in people with COVID, particularly among young people, that the hazards of obesity are magnified among young people and that message really needs to get out there.